but <laughs> you can see. So this is a little American alligator. It's not a crocodile. Okay, here we go. Here's a couple more. In fact, one of them just flew. This seashore has been shaped by a variety of factors, wind, currents, tides, and wave action. And this particular beach is being shaped by erosion. So this is the eroding end of a barrier island. And so you can look back here, this is called a boneyard beach. You can see trees that have fallen in, you can see root balls that are visible. This was once forest. And what's happening is the ocean is taking back over. It's hard to imagine that this sand is really made up of just two things. It's made up of shells, little marine invertebrates that have been pulverized into little tiny sand particles. And it's also made up of quartz. And that quartz has come down from the Appalachian Mountains, down Brownwater Rivers, and it's deposited just north of here in the Atlantic Ocean. The animals that live here have to be extremely resilient. Let's spend a day at the beach and get a look at some of these incredible creatures. You know, there are a lot of great fish that live right off the beach here. So I've got a rod. I actually have one in the water already. I'm going to hook up another one. I've got a little bit of shrimp here. Put a little bit on my circle hook. And then what I'm going to do is cast this out and see what we can catch. So while we're waiting on a bite, I thought we might look for some animals that live under the sand. And here is a great example of that. This is a sand dollar. I can just see the outline of his body, which is a perfect circle. And I'm gonna scoop them up very carefully. A lot of times you find dead sand dollars. This is a live one. So sand dollars are actually more closely related to starfish. They're echinoderms. And they're covered with little tiny tube feet. And that's one of the ways that I can tell that this animal's alive. When you find dead ones, all you find is the bony a skeleton of them. This guy I can tell has all these little tube feet and those tube feet are what allows this animal to move and actually burrow underneath the sand. Fabulous animal. Some people call these a keyhole urchin. That's another name for it. Interesting creature. Let's see what else we can find. One of the coolest beach creatures is one that people almost never see. In fact, it lives in the sand. I'm looking for something very specific. I'm looking for a little tiny hole that looks like it has little chocolate sprinkles around it. Now, I have this thing right here. This is a slurp gun of sorts, and it's designed to suck up a column of sand and water. And this will allow me, hopefully, to pull one of these creatures out of the sand so we can get a good look at it. But the first step is to find some burrows where these things live. Now here's one right here and it's kind of bubbling and that means it's active so that means there's an animal inside here so I'm going to use this device right here and we're going to see if we can catch what's inside this burrow now this is exactly what I was hoping to find this is an animal called a ghost shrimp some people call these mud shrimp and one thing about these guys is they're amazingly delicate and that's probably because they spend the, their entire lives in burrows. So they don't need a hard protective coating like a lot of other crabs and shrimp do. This guy does have a really neat claw that he uses to kind of protect his head. And he'll pull that into position and that protects his head, which is the most vulnerable part of his body. Now he's shaped a little bit like a, a basic shrimp, but boy, are they different looking. I mean, they look almost alien. I mean, they look like something from a science fiction movie or something. You notice these appendages right here. Those are obviously designed to move water, and they'll pull water into the burrow along with sediment that this animal can feed on. This is a great example of hidden biodiversity, creatures that live here that we're just absolutely not aware of. Unless we knew exactly how to find a ghost shrimp, we'd never even know they lived here. 
If you spend some time looking around in the little tide pools like this, you can see some kind of neat things. And this is, ow, this guy got a pretty good bite on me. He peeled him off. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how hard even little crabs can bite. He's just got a little tiny piece of skin here, so I can pry him off and I think I'll be fine. <laughs> they have like little vices. Okay, good, we got him off. So this is a speckled swimming crab. Beautiful little crab, uh, great coloration. Uh, it looks like most swimming crabs. It has those paddles on the back feet, and of course walking legs, and also the claws that they use for feeding, and also to protect themselves as well. This cryptic coloration, you notice he's got this beautiful pattern on him, and that pattern is really good for blending in with the sand. This is a crab that you commonly find on the beach, and he has to be able to blend into the environment that he lives in. He also has to be a fairly athletic crab because he has to race in and out with the waves, so he's gotta have the strength to be able to deal with a, a really rough place to live. These guys have the amazing ability to disappear under the sand. So if you put them down, they just back in underneath the sand. And of course, this is what protects them from gulls and uh, fish and all sorts of other predators that like to eat crabs, small crabs like this. Okay, we got a bite. I think we got something. I think we may have something on. The waves make it really hard to tell. Yeah, there's definitely something on here. I'll tell you what, the weather is taking a turn for the worse. Oh, cool. So it's a little shark. This looks like a little baby Atlantic sharp-nosed. And that, this is a pup from this year. So this is one that was just born very, very recently. Of course, probably right off the, right off the beach here. And this, this is an animal that'll get about that long as an adult, and it'll spend its whole life living in these waters. Uh, but what they typically do is move offshore when the water gets really cold. So they'll move offshore or a little bit south, and then they'll come back to the same beach next year. So I'm gonna get the hook out of this little guy. And I've, I've knocked the barbs down on these hooks so that it, it won't hurt the shark very much to catch it. Rinse this guy off a little bit. So this is one of our smallest shark species, the Atlantic sharp nose. And these, typically these things will have some white spots on them. This one's still, still a very young shark, and it'll take her two or three years to reach adult size. But you notice it has little black tips in the fins, and a lot of sharks have this. So just because they're black tips, it does not mean it's a black tip shark. A lot of people want to call all the sharks that you catch on the beach sand sharks. In reality, uh, we, don't, we don't have a true sand shark here. We have things like this Atlantic sharp nose. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get this little guy back in the water. It looks like the weather is getting kind of bad. It looks like we may have a thunderstorm coming in or something. So I'm going to let him go. So this is not your typical beach. It's a wonderful combination of sandy beach and silty mud flats. The key to it is particle size. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I've got this glass of clear water, and I want to put some sand in it. And notice how quickly these particles fall to the bottom. That's because they're heavy, so they're falling down much more quickly. These are the particles that would be on the more dynamic portion of the beach that gets a lot of wave action. Now this is a different section of the beach, so let's take a look at the particle size here. And twirl this around. Notice this is not clearing very quickly. This is much smaller sediment. In fact, this is silt, and it's gonna remain suspended in the water much longer. Now, I'll tell you why this is important, because not all animals use the same portion of the beach. Some of them like these silty areas, and some of them, of course, like that much coarser sand. Comparing silt to sand is like comparing a golf ball to a basketball. Tidal pools like this are a great place to find animals, but you gotta really slow down and take the time to look for them. In fact, you kinda gotta track them. And if we look right here, you'll see a squeakly line that goes along through the mud here and stops right here. And I'll bet if we dig down into the end of this trail right here, we'll see something really cool. So let's see if we can dig this guy up. Feel him, and here he is. It's a, it's a baby horseshoe crab. 
and this one was probably hatched out last year. And adult horseshoe crabs will come up on the beach here and they'll lay their eggs and most of these eggs get eaten by birds and fish and other things, but some of them make it and grow into these little horseshoe crabs. Now these guys have to spend almost their entire lives hidden. They tunnel along underneath the sand and this protects them from all sorts of things that want to eat them. They also have spikes. They have the telson, which really isn't much of a weapon, but they have some pretty impressive spines on their back. So a lot of things would think twice about eating them. Uh, if they're lucky enough to, to get big enough or not eaten by a predator, these guys may get, females get this big around or so and males slightly smaller and they'll probably come up on the same beach and lay their eggs later on. If you look really closely, this whole area is just littered with these little trails. So there are literally millions of horseshoe crabs in this area. Unless you really take the time, you're just not gonna see them. And of course, that's the whole plan for the horseshoe crabs. You know, the sediment along here is really fine and it's, it's great for certain gastropods. And this is exactly what I was looking for. And you see a lot of these here. And you can just see part of the shell sticking out. This is very likely one of the whelks. And it's, they spend most of their lives underground. Now these things are major predators and they feed on things like clams and other bivalves and even other gastropods. So let's dig this guy up. And this is a big one. I can tell, so I'm gonna squeeze underneath him. I'm gonna pull him out of the sand. And you can see, now he's closing up, he's pumping all that water out and closing up. He's got this cover called an operculum. <laughs> you see all the water flying out. Now what's really cool about this one, this is a lightning whelk. I was expecting to see a knobbed whelk, but I can tell this is a lightning whelk because it's left-handed. You know, if you pick up a knobbed whelk, it's going to be right-handed. See how you could stick your hand into the left side? So this is, as I was saying, a major predator. It feeds on bivalves. It'll eat clams. And what it likes to do is grab a clam, and it uses this big muscular foot to pull that clam against this sharp edge. And it pulls with so much force that it can actually open up the bivalve and push its foot and its stomach actually inside and consume the clam. I'll tell you, it is really cool to live in a part of the world where you have this much diversity of life around you. If you're lucky enough to find an oyster rake like this, you're likely to find a real concentration of animals. Because a lot of animals like to remain hidden, and they hide in stuff like this. Here's another really neat trail to follow. And if we follow right along here, <laughs> I know what it's gonna terminate in, and you come up to this guy. And this is one of the moon snails, a shark eye, Atlantic moon snail. And it gets that name because the top of the shell here looks a little bit like the eye of a shark. Great name for this animal. And you see it's got this huge, huge foot. And these guys will tunnel along on this, this large foot and with just a little bit of the shell exposed, and they key in on the smell of bivalves and other moon snails and things like that that they like to eat, and they feed on them. Once they find one, they will take the radula, which is this sort of raspy mouth part, and they will just work away at a shell until they make this beautiful little beveled hole in it, and then they stick in their proboscis or proboscis, and they secrete an enzyme that causes the animal to uh, relax a little bit so that they can work the shell open if it's a bivalve or get inside and then they can actually feed on the other animal. Incredible predator. And you can see this guy's just kind of tunnel along on my hand. He's starting to shrink up a little bit, so I'm going to let this guy go, let him go about his business. I've assembled a nice selection of hermit crabs here, and these are all ones that I found right in this area. Now, hermit, this is really all the same species of hermit crab, but they use different kinds of shells, and that's what's so cool. These are thin striped hermit crabs, but some of them have chosen channeled whelks like this one. Some of them have chosen knobbed whelks. Here's a moon snail. 
which is a really, so that's a big one. Boy, that's about as big as moon snails get. A couple others, and then this is the really cool one. This is a horse conch, and this is a baby horse conch. They get, you know, this long or so. It's one of the biggest gastropods that in the entire southeast. They get massive, two feet long. Let's look at one of these guys up close. See who's, all these are inhabited, but what they've done is they've tucked their bodies way down inside the shell. Let me see if I can get one that'll come out a little bit more. But hermit crabs are quite different from other crabs. And they have 10 legs, decapods like other crabs, but the last two legs are used primarily to hold on to the inside of the shell. Now they don't have a hard exoskeleton the way blue crabs and some of the others do. Their bodies are much softer. Now they do have claws, two claws, and uh, they use those to break up small things and pick up things off the bottom and feed on them. But the real advantage these guys have is this shell. And this shell protects them from all kinds of predators. And if they didn't have this with their soft bodies, they would certainly get eaten. And every now and then you'll see a bird pulling a hermit crab out of its shell. Now periodically, hermit crabs have to change shells. And that means they have to find a shell that's maybe a little bit bigger, maybe a little more attractive to them. And shells are quite a commodity in this area. I mean, on the beach here. So if you put a shell down with no crab in it, it would not be long at all before that becomes inhabited by a type of hermit crab. The beach is divided into three zones. The first zone is the subtidal. So we're at low tide. So this area is inundated by water all the time. Creatures that live here have to be submerged in the water all their lives. The next zone is what's called the intertidal zone, and that's the area between the low tide mark and the high tide mark. And that zone starts right here, and it ends right here. Animals that live in this zone have to have the ability to stay submerged for many hours a day and then completely dry. They also have to be able to handle very cool temperatures and very, very hot temperatures. The intertidal zone often has tidal pools in it, and these pools are filled with all kinds of small fish and other creatures. Above the high tide line is what's called the superlittoral zone, and that's the area that includes the dunes and the very edges of the maritime forest. And this is a harsh place to live, and it is, isn't usually inundated by water. In fact, it's only inundated during very heavy storms or extremely high tides but it is influenced by salt spray. This zone is also where sea turtles nest. So sea turtles will crawl up on the beach, crawl all the way up above the high tide line, and that's where they lay their eggs. And you can see right behind us, there's an area that's roped off. That's a sea turtle nest. This particular nest had 70 eggs in it, and they were laid earlier this year. There's a covering over this thing, and that's to protect it from a variety of predators. Lots of things love to eat sea turtle eggs. They're full of nutrition, raccoons, foxes, ghost crabs and a variety of other predators will try and get in and feed on those eggs. One of the other problems is people. We need to leave these eggs alone. We want these eggs to hatch and we want these turtles to be able to get back down the water, swim out in the ocean and start a life of their own. One of the other things you notice are these rack lines and these are areas where uh, floating debris, especially plant material and even dead animal carcasses and things have kind of floated up and stayed there at the high tide line. Uh, we've had a couple of really big tides, so this line of rack on the very top edge is obviously from a huge spring tide. Let's walk up into the dunes and get a look at some of the life that lives up in here. Here's an animal that you don't get to see during the day very often. But I saw the burrow. I've been seeing a lot of burrows, but if you look really closely in there, you can actually see the crab. This is the burrow of a ghost crab. This is an animal that is a tremendous burrower and spends most days underneath the sand. And you can see a pile of sand here that he's excavated out of this hole. And that gives you a pretty good idea how deep this hole actually is. This guy's just partially down the hole. And what I'm gonna do is try and scoop my hand underneath and see if I can get a hold of him. You can see he's, he's come out. Now ghost crabs have pretty good claws. So I'm gonna be a little careful with this guy. Got him. This guy ran off, but I managed to catch him. He got hung up in some racks, so I was able to catch him. This is that ghost crab I was talking about, and they have amazing claws. You can see this guy, his little serrations, both on the outside of his claws and also on the inside. 
These things can stay out of water for a long time. As long as their gills stay fairly moist, they can live on land. Now they are capable, they're good swimmers, and sometimes you can see them just run right into the water, right into the surf. In fact, if you chase them, that's, that's one of the things that happens. That's how they get away. Ghost crabs eat a lot of different things, dead fish on the beach. They're pretty much scavengers, but one of the things they also like to eat is sea turtle eggs. And they will actually burrow down into a sea turtle nest that's full of eggs and feed on those eggs. And of course, you know, a lot of them won't hatch. I'm gonna put this guy down and I'll tell you, he is gonna be gone. There he goes. If you're a plant, this is a pretty rough place to make a living. And this beach morning glory, for instance, is growing in really dry sand. I mean, the roots spread out across here and help to hold the soil. Here's another plant. This is a sand spur, and this is the nemesis of anybody wearing flip-flops or bare feet at the beach. These things have very, very sharp little spines on them, and if you step on one of these, of course, it sticks to you, sticks in your foot or whatever, but also if it attaches to an animal, the animal walks off with it and then carries this thing, which is a seed, and of course, it ends up uh, germinating somewhere else away from the original plant. Let's walk up and see what else we can see. One of the best known of all beach plants, or plants that live in the dunes, is this one right here. These are sea oats. Now these things are very, very important because they have massive root structures which have tendency to hold the sand and hold the dunes together and prevent erosion. Another thing that is really, really important are covered walkways like this. When we walk across the dunes, we can do a lot of damage. So just a simple addition of a raised wooden walkway like this can really help to protect the dunes. You find some live animals at the beach, but the majority of what you find are things like this. Shells of an animal that died and washed up on shore. I've invited my good friend Bruce Lampright. Bruce is the naturalist from Bray's Island. Bruce, good to see you. Hey, and he's going to show us some of the creatures that live on our local beaches. Bruce, what do you got? Well, let's see what you got there, Tony. This is uh, one of the many species of bivalves, animals with two shells, called an arc. And this is the incongruous arc. would have another a valve or shell that wouldn't quite fit with this one, so it's incongruous, so a great name for that. Very common on our yeah, beaches. Yeah, this is one that you see a lot of, isn't it? It is, very common. Um, I picked up some things here today that some are not so common here, some are quite common up on the beaches. Some are from right here in shallow water. Some are from deep water that find their way all the way to the beach, like this calico scallop. Boy, that's a beautiful shell. Yeah, beautiful. Found in waters up to about 100 feet deep or more, so it can wash way in uh, and that's a big collector's item. People love to pick those up. Uh, a big guy, a big bivalve, again, is one of the quahog clams. Now I always don't know whether they call it quahog or quahog. Or... <laughs> quahog, Q-U-A-H-O-G, uh, but quahog is the pronunciation. Well, that's a big one too. And this one was uh, just recently dead when I picked it up, cleaned it out a little bit. This is the southern quahog clam. This would not be good eating at this no, time. Very it? chewy, uh, even in chowder. You'd have to chop it up and even then it'd be tough. But this is the southern cousin to the northern quahog clam that we have right there with the purple on it. Beautiful purple coloring. And this is the one that makes up most of our commercial industry here in South Carolina. And this is a better eating size. Obviously. Much, much better. And even smaller than that would be, you know, for the half shell or for the uh, very tender raw, if you like to eat them that way. Uh, another one that people like to eat is one that's not that common on the beaches. This is one of the two pen shells, P-E-N. Uh, this is the rigid pen shell and its cousin, the, uh, the sawtooth pen shell. And shrimpers tell me that these are excellent eating when they drag a few up once in a while in their nets as a piece of meat that looks much like a scallop. And you're saying smooth and rough by the fact this one's fairly, this one's much more rugose. And... Exactly, big teeth on it. These more like a, like a file and you could probably sand something with it. And the name pen shell comes from the fact that, it, is that right? Exactly. It looks a little bit like a pen. And these would be anchored in the bottom offshore uh, or in inlet mouths or inside the inlets. So not right here on the high energy sandy beach, which is a tough place for, for these uh, mollusks to live. I mean, when you think about it, waves crashing down. Uh, I don't know if you can see these well, Tony, but these two little guys right here, 
Uh, there's a dwarf surf clam and a coquina clam. They're much better adapted to living in this surf. And this is ones that you'll dig up uh, and you see them scooting around here in the surf. And I know at times you'll see sometimes the shore is just littered with these little surf yeah. clams. Millions, just millions of them all over the place. But again, they live right in And that these surf. are adults? Those are both? Those are full-size adults uh, there. Uh, pretty good comparison. <laughs> yeah. One bivalve and another one. It is. Uh, of course, our common Atlantic oyster here. And when we talk about bivalves, animals with two shells, we talk about a right-hand valve, this top one and then a left-hand valve, which is the bottom one, an oyster at least, that always attaches to something else. Whether it's another oyster in this case, you can see the oyster shell there, uh, or uh, anything hard, you know, a soda bottle, anything like that, they'll attach to a piling. Uh, I brought with me uh, a kind of a neat fossil off the beach. This one came from the upper part of South Carolina's beach up in the Grand Strand, and this is a fossil urchin, not a bivalve or a univalve, but a really neat a specimen off the beach. This one from the late Cretaceous period is about 65 to 70 million years old. So things we could find on the beach, people may walk right by. Bruce, you brought us some great things to look at. There's some really neat stuff. But remember, this is a tiny fraction of what lives on and around this beach. Bruce, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for watching Coastal Kingdom.